So I'm going to give us a minute as the numbers of participants keeps increasing. All right, while we um, have all our participants joining us, I'd like to welcome you all to this session of Another Look, our fall session. We are delighted that we're able to continue uh, Another Look today, as well as uh, into the near-term future for sure, thanks to continuing studies that continues to provide us with a bit of funds, thanks to some donations that we've received from uh, some of you out there, we are now making it easier for those donations to come through and Cynthia Haven uh, will be in touch with you about that process down the line. I have a number of thanks to um, extend not only to the, to the donors, but also, well, to Cynthia Haven, our tireless uh, administrator of Another Look. Christina Fayardo is here with us from Continuing Studies, helping us with the logistics of the webinar. Thanks a lot, Christina, for your input. I want to thank our panelists. There's Maria Masuko, who is a graduate student um, here in the Division of Literatures, Languages, and Culture. She is a specialist of 20th century um, uh, novelistic literature, especially uh, novels written by women. And I want to thank Maria in particular for bringing my attention to this novel. I had not known about uh, Olivia before last June. And uh, on her recommendation, I read it over the summer. And then I spoke with um, Tobias Wolf, our uh, founder and previous director. And I wanna thank Tobias for actually agreeing to uh, go with this book. I have a feeling, but I don't know for sure that this is not exactly his kind of, uh, his cup of tea or it's the kind of novel that he would have chosen himself. So I, Grateful, Toby, that you're, you're going to be a, a discussant in this uh, in this particular uh, occasion. I have a few remarks to make, um, technical remarks. Uh, we have a chat that's open for you if you want to speak to your uh, chat among yourselves. But we also have a Q and A box if you look at the bottom of your uh, screen. That Q and A is where uh, those of you who want to ask questions in the Q&A period, which would be in the last 20 to 30 minutes of our one and a half hour session today, that please uh, submit your questions in writing, your comments in writing in the Q&A, and we will um, hopefully be able to get to them all, or at least as many as we can. So I just want to tell you what it was about this novel that interested me enough to um, uh, propose it to our colleagues uh, as uh, the novel of choice for another look this time. And I, I have to say that for me, what interests me above all about the novel is the story it tells about the connection between love and education, which I think is a very substantial connection. A few quotes for you, the German poet Goethe said, we learn only from those we love. A contemporary of his, Frederick Hodelin, also a poet said, I quote, teachers give their best when they love. And yet another German, Friedrich Nietzsche, claimed that the deepest insights spring from love alone. So this love affair between, let's call it love and learning in the Western tradition goes back all the way to the pedagogical revolution uh, that Socrates brought about in Greek education. Uh, Socrates, interestingly, was the first person to introduce personal love into the learning process. And what was so unusual about him in the context of Greek pedagogy is that, uh, you know, in, in Greece and in Athens in particular, the professional sophists taught pupils for wages. But Socrates not only refused payment from his students, but he loved each one of his students personally and felt it was important that it was an absolutely crucial ingredient of a proper transmission or education 
so, and by loving them personally, that's a you know an expansive notion. I, I could say even more precisely that what he loved was that formative place in the student's soul where love of knowledge could take root and germinate. Uh, in other words, teaching required a significant investment of philia or love, which Socrates considered the very currency of philosophia or the love of wisdom. Uh, and just to continue for another moment in my pedantry, one of the students whom Socrates loved in this personal manner was Plato, who in his famous seventh letter wrote that paideia or education in the truest sense takes place in the live presence of teachers and students and above all in the spoken words exchanged between them in their ongoing conversation with one another. And that word conversation in the seventh letter in Greek is sinousia, which means, uh, it means conversation, it also means intercourse and is sometimes used interchangeably for, for uh, sexual intercourse or verbal intercourse. But I think Plato meant it really in terms of a conversation. Why do I say that? It's because Plato in that letter refers to a living and animate speech. That's a quote, a living and animate speech that comes forth from the souls of teacher and students in real time. And that this kind of speech is not written on papyrus or on parchment uh, paper, but is written, quote, on the soul of the hearer together with understanding. And I believe that living and animate are the key words here. So education, and with it, the life of the mind is rooted in the student's animate selfhood. So the most intense kind of learning, I would say, and I think this novel uh, gives us reason to consider this, is passionate rather than passive, driven by desire, rather than duty. And in fact, in its etymology, the verb to study actually means to desire, to strive toward, to show zeal for. Studium in Latin originally meant keenness or eagerness. And one last uh, reference in this line before uh, I conclude my opening remarks. The medieval poet Dante understood what it meant to study in this passionate manner. Before he wrote the Divine Comedy, he wrote a short book called the Vita Nuova or New Life, which tells the story of his love for a young woman named Beatrice, whom he saw as a quasi angelic being. And Dante composed most of his early lyric poems for Beatrice but when she died abruptly at the age of 24, he fell into an existential crisis and lost his poetic voice. And then in the very last chapter of the Vita Nuova, he tells his reader that he has decided to stop writing until, I quote, I may speak of Beatrice in a more worthy manner. And in order to do that, he says, I am studying as much as possible. Io studio quanto posso. Io studio quanto posso. I'm studying as much as I can. So we have love, desire, and study all coming together in this culminating chapter of the Vita Nuova. And now I don't bring up Dante here just to show off my erudition, uh, but because the Vita Nuova, I think, has a discreet and important presence in the novel uh, at hand, Olivia. In chapter five of the novel, Signorina tells Olivia, but we have talked enough now, you must say your sonnet. And Olivia begins to recite a sonnet by Dante in the original Italian. Uh, tanto gentile, tanto onesta pare la donna mia, quando ella altrui saluta. Con ogni lingua diven tremando muta, e gli occhi non l'ardiscono di guardare. So gentle and so modest appears my lady when she greets others that every trembling tongue falls silent and, and eyes hardly dare to look on her. This is the first stanza of a 
sonnet from the Vita Nuova about Beatrice's appearances or her appearance in the streets of Florence and how they had an epiphanic quality about it, somewhat like you know, Jesus entering Jerusalem. And in our novel, Olivia asked Laura, if you remember, a pointed question. Laura, I said to her one day toward the end of the day, do you love her? Laura answers that, of course, she loves her. Uh, she's opened my eyes to all I like best in the world, etc. Then Laura asks, does your heart beat when you go into the room where she is? Do you hardly dare raise your eyes to look at her and yet not succeed in turning them away? And that question, I submit, really does speak the language of Dante's Vita Nuova, which describes the narcotic effect that the presence of Beatrice had on him. So those of you who read the Vita Nuova will remember that Dante becomes faint-hearted in her presence when she greets him one day, quote, I seem to behold the entire range of possible bliss. I became so ecstatic that like a drunken man, I turned away from everyone and sought the loneliness of my room. Olivia undergoes a similar experience in chapter three of our novel. I'm gonna quote, I went to bed that night in a kind of daze, slept as if I had been drugged, and in the morning awoke to a new world, call it a vita nuova, a new life, a world of excitement, a world in which everything was fierce and piercing, everything charged with strange emotions, clothed with extraordinary mysteries, and in which I myself seemed to exist only as an inner core of palpitating fire. So this state altering love is world disclosive. It breaks open an infinite horizon to the seeker of knowledge. In fact, Olivia goes on to say that she attacked her studies with renovated ardor and that quote, every page of Latin held some passionate secret that must be mine or I should die. And the same goes for geography, to sit pouring and wondering over an atlas, history and scripture. I mean, you all, you get the point. The novel's protagonist, in my uh, view, is at bottom the love that moves the sun and the other stars. It's, uh, and I think that one of the reasons I wanted to read this novel with my colleagues and, uh, and the rest of you is that in my view, with the exception of Plato's seventh letter, no other text known to me speaks so directly about the furnace of the soul where the love of knowledge catches fire and turns this student into a living flame of passion. Now, of course, there's a lot more to the novel in that, and I am very much looking forward to hearing what our panelists have to say about it. So I would like to invite Maria Masuko to share her thoughts with us first. Maria. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert. That um, that's quite a, a parallel to draw for this for this little novel. But I, I um, I'm excited to see where the comparison uh, leads us. I um, I was very interested in the the new cover. Perhaps I can begin there by um, in this Penguin classic. But um, my own encounter with the novel, uh, which is where I'd like to start with my with my remarks was in a much older um, cover page. And I think I'll share it with everyone just because it's uh, the image that I think encapsulates um, some of the themes really beautifully. Uh, and, and I'll use it to kind of orient two, two things that I'd like to mention, two things that I really enjoy uh, and find quite rich about this little novel. Um, so this is the uh, one of the early, early title pages of, of the first edition of the novel of Olivia by Olivia. Um, and what we get in this in this image uh, where I'll start is that at the very dead center of, um, of the portrait, we have the book, which I don't think is very foreign to the remarks that you were you were just making. Um, and, and one of the things that excites me so so much about this uh, exploration of adolescent learning and um, it's quite a beautiful take on, on the, the art of finishing a young woman um, is the importance of literature and the, the centrality of, um, of language, uh, but also in particular, the, the, a very woman writerly take on this, um, on this centrality of literature and language because um, the author herself was a translator and the text, even though it is brief um, and, and rapid, 
it makes a lot of space within itself for extended citations in other languages for intertextuality and for bringing in um, the presence of, of literary uh, greats that, that have a huge influence on, um, on our protagonist's soul and mind uh, in this year that she spends away. Um, and so what this, uh, what this image gets at is the fact that there is a mediation going on here. So, um, you know, we have uh, another uh, Dante um, reference in a, in, a, in a sense, Galeotto fu'l libro e chi lo scrisse. There is no, um, there is no contact between these, uh, these impossible um, beloveds without the, the text that brings them together. But then this text also stands in for an entire world of, of knowledge and an inheritance of, uh, of learning that is going on and is being passed along in this highly entertaining, but also just beautifully episodically rich uh, women-centric cosmos of learning. So another thing that this, uh, that this cover piece or this, um, this title page um, shows us is that there is a, uh, to, to us perhaps appearing old fashioned, but a really um, uh, in many ways, um, uh, personally based hierarchy of learning and, and uh, instructional dynamics going on in this novel. So we have um, the, the younger children who are read to by the older girls, the older girls who are sitting in the library doing the devoir together, the, they are also being read to independently in special sessions with uh, Mademoiselle Julie, and then there are particular favorites who are taken by Julie, who are, you know, selected as the special ones and they're brought out into the city. And there's this progressive opening out, uh, you know, from the very protected and yet stimulating world of the, of the women's finishing school into this incredible environment, which is 1880s Paris. Um, and, and that in and of itself is, is what gives, I, I understand it, to give a sense of historical urgency and excitement to this work that we, we don't find in um, texts uh, from the 1930s that are writing about the 1930s, because there is a real backslide in openness uh, in women's education and, uh, and women's mobility that happens in those 50 years. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll return for a, for a moment um, then to the image to point to another thing, uh, another avenue for, for my remarks, which is the parallel um, between the title and the author's name. But what I really like about this, uh, this title page is that there is a bow on the O, this is gonna seem obvious, and there's a bow on the head of the child, obviously. So the, the title is referring to the adolescent Olivia. And by, you know, um, by parallel, by connection, by comparison, the author, uh, author name and the pseudonym is referring to what I understand to be the adult, more, much more mature um, writing Olivia or the, the narrator who is in a completely different time and space. Um, and what this is another dynamic, very typical of women's writing of the 20th century. But um, what I find to be mined in a, in, a, in a quite effective way in this text, which is the particular affective quality of the relationship that this adult narrator has with her own adolescent self. And this speaks very much to what you were saying, Robert, about the formative place in a student's soul. It's very old fashioned idea. Um, and, and yet it gets an, a, a a reinvigoration in this text that um, Olivia, the author, the writer, or Olivia, the, the older narrator, um, believes in her adolescent self as a genuine site, a bedrock of emotional validity and, and innocence that verges on purity and inspiration. Um, so I believe that the, the way that the author is able to pull off what she worries about in her introduction, this balance that she needs to strike between hardening something down to, to its bare facts and being too direct and losing structure altogether and falling into sentimentality. That's what she worries about in, in the introduction. The way that she pulls it off in my understanding is that she really invests in this particular year of her life as being a source, um, not just in reference to the love interest, but also in, in terms of her personal development, her worldview, her network, her, her contacts. And one of the things that I, um, that I appreciate most uh, um, 
with respect to other narratives of women, uh, women protagonists is that the narrative is not structured around uh, the eventuality of marriage. When she, um, when she envisions her life as will follow the finishing school, the contact with these women and with these models, um, it inspires her to consider the possibility of taking certifications and exams, moving to another country, becoming an instructor, um, you know, living nearby or working along with the woman she admires. And when she's suffering heartache, even in those instances, she desires to be an actress or a singer or even a poet so that she has a, a cathartic avenue, an artistic cathartic a avenue for, for the immensity of emotion that she's going through. So all of this multiplicity of figural possibility that the novel entertains is um, in a way working against a, a more rigid uh, and traditional um, binary of narrative outcomes offered to women protagonists, which would be marriage or death. Um, I really appreciate that element, um, and and when it comes to the way that this that this um, this line is kept nice and taut between the protagonist as an adolescent and the um, the fervent, intimate, but a bit more wise and experienced narrative voice, um, I'll just point to a few of my favorite uh, moments that that are what I understand to be almost um, little gems uh, that are sprinkled, little temporal gems that are sprinkled throughout the text. Um, that, that keep us uh, in constant contact with the, with the temporality of the writing. Um, and these are these references, these highly personal um, references to the present. So when Laura, who uh, we've already talked about a bit, when they strike up a friendship during Laura's visit and Olivia is upset when she has to leave and she asks when she'll see her again. And Laura says, well, when you leave school on page 41, um, we'll sh we shall see each other very often. We will be friends all our lives. And then the narrator jumps in to say, and so dear Laura, we have been. This is a, an incredibly Jane Eyre, you know, um, reader leave reference that, that uh, is just a play to the pleasure of the, of the reading ear, but it's also incredibly personal. It's not dear reader, it's dear Laura. You know, there's a, there's a reference to a particular um, reader, a particular friendship. Um, and, and at least for me, this is a bit of a, um, you know, an electric shock to the body of the reader that reminds you that there are multiple temporalities going on. And then there's also the element of gossip when we get to hear that the beautiful Cecile, um, you know, she, she thinks uh, she will marry an English Duke and in parentheses we get, and so she did. You know, these moments of, um, of, uh, of knowledge of looking back on, on the time that's passed and, and filling us in in a gossipy way um, keep us very much uh, in, in the network of, uh, of chatter. Um, but it's also tied to, um, a much more object-oriented, sentimental, um, uh, weighty reference to the permanence, the, the material permanence of the love story that's at the center of the work. Um, and, and that is in reference to the object of the ivory paper cutter. So the fact that the work concludes with uh, this object having traveled from the very first evening of, uh, of the reading aloud through uh, the, the ups and downs of the tempestuous emotions into the gift giving and the gift rejection through the will back into the hands of, of the writer. And then at the, in the very last line of the work, we have it um, uh, present on the writing desk, you know, a, a, an object that is very much at the center and, and in parallel with the written text. Um, I think all of this has its, uh, its affective resonance uh, reinforced by also by the lighter moments, by this constant uh, tug of war between the, the year of adolescence and, um, and the years that have passed ever since um, that, are, that are slightly being filled in with, with winking um, with asides uh, by our narrating adult. Um, and with that, um, I've already said plenty. I will, I will conclude and leave the, um, the floor to Toby. So Toby, welcome again. And Please, uh, if you, if you, if there's anything about this novel that really bugs you or anything, don't feel like you have to hold back. Just you know. No, I. Uh, uh, incidentally, I, I thought that cover that you showed was great. I love the little Eiffel Tower in the back, so we know where we are. Um, the uh, no, I'm I'm fascinated by uh, uh, by stories of worlds within our world. Um, and, uh, you know, say uh, uh, a ship 
makes a kind of world in Catherine Ann Porter's Ship of Fools, uh, and uh, or or a or a military unit, and how these worlds show the larger world uh, in ways that are difficult for us to show, except in this sort of enormous 19th century way, which which uh, we don't really have recourse to anymore. We don't have the confidence that we can put our arms around that large a, uh, a picture. Um, and uh, so school, I love school uh, stories. I love school novels. Uh, Maybe I, I have even read Tom Brown's School Days um, uh, and uh, uh, set in rugby, Mark, uh, Matthew Arnold's father uh, school, uh, though I actually much prefer uh, George MacDonald Fraser's uh, takeoff on that in his Flashman novels. He has a hilarious take on uh, Tom Brown's School Days. Uh, great fun with it but uh it's a it's a it's a powerful tradition in our literature the school story and i it, i mean part of what i described to you in in my email my reaction to it was that it was somewhat airless and claustrophobic but in a way that's the point you are confined i think of uh uh i mean among among my favorite of in this genre uh uh Anthony Pohl's wonderful first volume in his uh, Dance to the Music of Time, A Question of Upbringing, set at Eton. Um, Cyril Connolly's Enemies of Promise, also set at Eton. Uh, Louis Auchincloss's uh, The Rector of Justin, set at Groton in this school. Uh, John Knowles, a separate piece, set at Exeter. Um, Obviously, Catcher in the Rye is a is a is a, a, a book everyone reads at one point or other, and they uh, uh, there's a there's a tremendous uh, uh, gift to the writer in being able to confine uh, the scrutiny of these characters' intention in such a confined world, um, and. Uh, uh, and I liked that about this novel. I liked that there was no escape from it, that, that you, were, you were there with them. Uh, I'm interested in what you had to say about, you know, love being essential to education. And that was certainly uh, the case in my own growing up. And in fact, at a boarding school, it was a teacher's uh, love, not only for his subject, English, but uh, for his students, and I think particularly for me, that uh, changed my life, and uh, uh, and was a was a gift uh, that that uh, I can't uh, ever ever repay. But at the same time, that love which you offer uh, can be. Uh, uh, be, can become a, a, a powerful weapon in the hands of, of, uh, of someone like uh, uh, Julie. Uh, I saw Terry Castle leave a little remark here, but Robert, Julie is a monster. Yes. And, uh, you know, I tend to agree with Terry on that. There, there is, uh, uh, she uses the power of those girls' attachment to her uh, for her own ends, and they aren't necessarily for the good of the, of the girls to satisfy herself. There is that trip, that wonderful escape to Paris and the museum that, that uh, Olivia has with her is a kind of seduction, actually. And, uh, uh, and it has, I think, dire consequences. Um, anyway, this, this hothouse of, uh, of a school generates a tremendous kind of dramatic tension that really is impossible to look away from. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll, why don't we have a more general discussion here? Okay, that's, yeah, so I gave a, an idealizing account of love and education, and I would like 
you know, I, I would like to uh, import it into the into the reading of the novel. I don't think Mademoiselle Julie is a monster at all. I I think that you cannot uh, give a student more than she gave Olivia in terms of a uh, an opening into, as Maria was saying, into the world of literature, <coughs> where we don't know. You know, the, she gave her. She gave her really the history of literature. She became an author. She became a translator. She, her whole. Um, we know biographically the, the her whole subsequent biography indicates that um, the person on whom Madame Julie is based on, Marie Sylvestre. Sylvestre is a. Uh, I have often wondered what share Racine had in lighting the flame that began to burn in my heart that night. I mean, is she in, is she in, she, people fall in love with their teachers at the same time they fall in love with the literature, the poets and the dances and things of that sort. And, and, and of course, we're here in France, we're not in Victorian England. In Victorian England, a, uh, a relationship between a, a teacher and student that was this uh, promiscuous in terms of transgressing some of the boundaries that we would want, usually want to maintain institutionally, uh, you know, it, 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 it's some, I, I don't think she does it for her own ulterior egoic motives. I think that Julie is, has the true vocation of a pedagogue and that there's a transmission going on even when it, 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 it even when she enlists the libidinal um, investments of her students in her and her own libidinal investments in in, um, in, her, in her students. I, uh, it, it, yeah, it's it's dangerous territory, but something comes alive in the in this uh, young protagonist's soul that is profoundly related to literature. And I, I agree with Maria's interpretation there that it was the book that brought us together. Now that book, it, you, you quoted the Italian, Maria, Galeotto fu il libro and, and chi lo scrisse, that's the um, culminating line of Francesca's speech in Inferno Five, where she and her brother-in-law were reading the Lancelot narrative. And when they got to the point where Lancelot kisses Guinevere, he, he put the book down and he kisses her. And she says that the book was the Galahot, the, the go-between and the person who wrote it. So that book literature has this mediating um, and it can lead to actual sexual, uh, uh, into sexual consummation, but it can also, you know, at, at the same time and, or by contrary, it can also lead to an enamorment with uh, you know the book itself, and this this is a case where I like the way the author goes to that point where you have the possibility of a, a rather abusive um, behavior on the part of Madame Julie. But I don't agree she's a, she's a monster because I don't I think there's a line there that she actually doesn't cross. I'm I don't think it's she maybe should be going into the into uh, you know the rooms at nighttime. But nevertheless, my dear, what do you what do you uh, how do you come down? Um... Yeah, I, I of course it's it's uh, it's open and you know there there's a degree of mystery that the author intends to leave in the interpretation of the word defeat or the interpretation of who of what it means when Olivia claims oh I am no saint I love that paragraph um, when she very much sets herself into a different category of um, of opinions and 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 self control and and even the worthwhileness of self control. But um, when it comes to the the line in and of itself, I think the one addition I would make in support of your um, reading of it, Robert, is Julie as a French woman is all about taste being part of education. And and so even when she makes all her comments about how Cecile the American is too up in arms about receiving. Um, comments about her aspect or about her, her appearance, Julie comes down quite hard on the fact that part of being a person of judgment and discernment in the world is being able to make direct personal comments, you know, give com compliments or critiques and, and be guided by your own, uh, your own tastes in these things. And I do think that for her, taste 
extends to attraction at, uh, and 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 real magnetism between her and certain favorites. You know, that there are there is a favoritism here that is not at all the vogue in contemporary education for many very um, good reasons, and yet has a real prominent uh, position in traditional education and and. I, I think there are a few amongst us that can claim to have never seen it in action and, and, and never been part of its, um, its incredible productivity in certain senses as well. Um, I, I think that when it comes to, to that element of the story in particular, um, Julie has conflicts with herself. You know, she has difficulties in holding herself back from, um, from having certain relationships with certain students. Um, but the novel is all about, in the end, the way that these episodes never come to the conclusion that Julie understands could occur, and Olivia is trying to figure out what it would be. And there's a bit of a gap between their realms of experience that never gets closed um, by the novel by the novel's conclusion. And my question, you know, then that makes me so interested in the the space of time that that goes on between that year at school and the time when Olivia, the the pseudonym of the author, writes the book is. So where, you know, then that's where it unfolds in her account, you know, but it's a completely different generation in a certain sense um, uh, with Julie, who, who ends up, the, the, the model for the character of Julie dies in 1905 and the book right. is written 30 years later. So, yeah, so Toby, you said that it has a claustrophobic element. I mean, this enclosed world, that, which is true, but precisely maybe it's that confinement that produces this sort of pressure that, allows for these, this, these extraordinary openings um, and, and expansive um, kind of states of rapture and, and openness to the world, even a little walk in the, in the, low, in, in the forest, even if it's on the, in the woods, maybe it's even the grounds of the school, but all of a sudden it, it opens up as, a, as an infinite horizon around um, the protagonist. Huh? There's, that's oh, why I think that's right. I think, no, I think it's absolutely, uh, uh, intentional to create exactly that pressure cooker of an atmosphere. Uh, and I think it's a, it's a virtue in the novel, but it is airless and, it, and it's combustible as well. Um, I wanna uh, get back to this uh, business of, of, uh, of love. There's a couple of kinds of love going on here and uh, the kind that I think is, is transformative of Olivia is the love that Julie shows her when she takes her seriously, when she is demanding of her in her work, in, uh, in her studies, and, and, uh, uh, and, she, and, and she, um, she twists that by her, uh, Tea, her physical teasing. Will she come into my room tonight? Oh no, she's going to go to Cecile's tonight. It's uh, and Julie's. Julie is no doubt very conscious of, of playing with their the, the the emotions of these uh, girls in this way, and uh, and it is perverse. It's also a very interesting part of the novel. Uh, I wouldn't wish it different, uh, but but it's. It, it complicates the characters and the situations really interestingly. So I have a question a bit for you, Toby, and also Maria. So we, we've all read the symposium, of Plato, it's a dialogue about love and it's all about homosexual love. And of course, um, you have all the characters who give their speeches and then Alcibiades crashes the party in a drunken stupor and he tells a story of how he tried to seduce Socrates and got into his bed and, and tried to get under his uh, tunic and all that. And Socrates was, uh, he was not in any way, you know, uh, having a, an excessive reaction. He was just trying to get Alcibiades to understand that perhaps he is directing his passions uh, in the wrong place, namely the person of Socrates, the body of Socrates, whereas the whole point of the Socratic teaching is how you take that erotic, libidinal uh, cathexis on, on the teacher and kind of redirect it to, or, uh, to, to a uh, 
you know, to, to a, a more at a more impersonal level, impersonal objects of knowledge and so forth. And I have, I, I'm going to be the champion of Julie till the bitter end t- today. <laughs> I think that she also, like Socrates, uses the the enamorment of Olivia and her other students and allows it, even encourages it. Oh, yeah. Uh, because once that passion uh, is inflamed, she can, uh, the whole world of poetry, Racine and, and Victor Hugo, that whole world is opened up in, in, it opens doors, in other words, I don't know. Hmm. The, there's also the, the kind of backstory, I think, is also quite interesting for Julie. I also absolutely adore her as a character, but she's going through a tumultuous relationship shift um, that is, I think, wreaking havoc on the dynamics of the school. And that's part of the hothouse element that I love, um, you know, speaking of this close environment um, that we, we come into a mess um, as readers because Olivia falls into a mess. And uh, you know it's worth considering if we're going to think of how Olivia, and this gets pointed out at several instances by Signorina and by um, Cara as well, that Olivia is different in certain ways. And she's also therefore um, out of a bit of a risk of being um, not just, I think, Robert, um, a, another student who, who falls into this dynamic of um, libidinal uh, activation and then um, uh, you know set on her way to enlightenment but she's a bit different and her relationship with Julie is a bit different but I think it can't be necessarily separated to the moment of crisis that's going on between the two headmistresses who previously were a really well-matched duo and they balanced each other out and they provided each other with the adult mature uh, companionship in whatever uh, degree of, of intimacy it might have been um, that now is 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 splintering, you know, in in the environment of this school, and Olivia falls right into the mess of it, um, and that's what makes her also such a perfect protagonist for a novel like this because she is at the center, even though in another in another circumstance or another year even of this same school, she would have been just on one team, and there would have been you know Mademoiselle Cara with all her team and equally balanced, and education would have been you know spinning on this is the end of this school. We are, we're witnessing a real crash and burn here. I don't think we're li- witnessing, you know, business as usual in terms of the educational cycle. Yeah. So as Terry Castle um, wants to in, jump in here. So I'm gonna read, uh, it's not in the order, but I'm gonna read the question that she is, is uh, posing to us because she's, She says, I'm enjoying the comments here greatly, but this is one of the greatest lesbian novels anyone has written. And I sense no one is particularly aware of the real background to the work or concerned to know about its place in a literary tradition. One that is among other things, French, not Italian and overwhelmingly about female, female erotic desire. Now, uh, you you wanna take a stab at that? Toby, do you, because um, it's clearly that I'm sure that there is this tradition of lesbian literature, but, and that's the way the book is, you know, that's the way it's marketed on this, on the Amazon sites and other sites is that this is, you know, falls into the genre of, of lesbian literature. But, um, you know, I, I, while there is no doubt that the lesbianism is, 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 is um, it's not in the background, it's actually up there forwardly. It's very clear that Cara and Julie have been living together for many years. They've been uh, they've been partners, and uh, the erotic the female erotic desire is just right there in front of in front of every reader to see uh, for themselves. But I think what's interesting, and I am agreeing with Maria, is that how do you manage? How do you negotiate the libidinal economy of a closed space that is a school? With all these girls and and teachers and and different hierarchies among them, I don't know, Toby. You want to weigh in on on that uh, that question? Well, I'm Terry's right in that I'm certainly not uh, I'm not steeped in in the tradition of this literature, but it was plain enough to me that that was what was happening in this uh, in this novel and uh, and 
you know, we haven't singled that out as a as a subject. Perhaps we should have more. Uh, in a sense, it's so almost every interaction is all factions that are have formed around Julian and Kara. Uh, they're falling out. Uh, 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 Frau Reisner's, uh, you know, attachment and and uh, you know, co-opting of a of, of a relationship, uh, the signorina. So there is this play of uh, of uh, homo homoerotic uh, uh, attachment and uh, jockeying for position and and uh, ingratiation that goes on through the novel. It's, there's no question about that. I'd like to go back to this to the quote that I only read in part about when uh, Olivia asked Laura whether she loves Madame Mademoiselle Julie, and I I wrote that page number down somewhere, but yeah. So it, maybe it bears. Th this is something that if we could uh, if we could get uh, get a response from Terry, maybe unfortunately through the through the Q and A box, but. She says, and tell me this, Laura, does you, you know, said, do you love her? He said, oh, you know, I do. She's been at the best part of my life. My father's too busy to talk to me too much. She has opened my eyes to all that I like best in the world, showing, showered me with innumerable treasures. And then she says, does your heart beat and so forth? And no, said, said Laura, none of that at all. What then, I insisted. Why, said Laura, looking at me with her clear, untroubled eyes, which had a kind of wonder and a kind of recoil in them there's nothing else i just love her mm. and this for me is evidence of the fact that you can have a love you know a very intense passionate love between the student and teacher which uh, in this case the, she, she has no even suspicion you know that it might have an erotic uh, motivation or drive behind it. And maybe it maybe it's not necessary. It's clearly a different case for Olivia. But uh, Laura is uh, an example of a, of, a, of a success story, I would say, in terms of the pedagogy that takes place in this school. It might be worth just adding to that, um, that line of, uh, of this being very much claimed and hailed as a, a landmark lesbian novel that one of the things I have I think it has going for it that gets a bit diluted by that um, by that label but should be maintained as a real feature of a good lesbian um, especially lesbian education setting novels and there are tons of them especially when you get to campus literature um, because there's a real kickback in the 70s against um, what they call smashing uh, which is you know hardcore crushing between women in women's campuses um, uh, and so novels like this are, are, are claimed as a kind of archaeology of, of uh, relationships, and, and they're very important to that end. But one of the things that this novel, I think, really, really shines uh, in doing is maintaining a multiplicity of the quality of relationships that go on in a women-only circle. Um, so rather than reducing uh, the, you know, boiling down the entire element of love in this novel to Olivia and Julie as potential lovers that are frustrated, that would be so reductive in, in, in the extent to which this is a really um, like crackling and, and static electricity kind of, uh, of collection of relationships. There are all sorts of dynamics that are built between the various women um, uh, you know, from, and, and Olivia even crit criticizes them on page 44. She very up, uh, up front says, I could never do what Signorina does for Julie. I could never put on her shoes every day. I could never be that kind of lover. Um, and this is a great, um, I think it's before we get a real crystallization of what a, a homonormative lesbian relationship has to look like. We have all of these different um, varieties of how a woman can relate to another woman uh, and how that can also be a sexual relationship or at least one that would like to become sexual. Um, 
uh, and then you know you have to consider the, oh. the the power dynamics and their their complicated elements in terms of the age difference and and the headmistress versus the student. Um, I just saw yesterday that they're going to make a new TV show of the play, The Children's Hour. Speaking of another school story with uh, two headmistresses who are accused of lesbian um, goings on. If anyone's interested in following it, yeah. yeah. And apparently the the uh, Dorothy. Strachey saw the 1939 German mo movie called Maschin. What's it? It's a. It's a. It's a very much of a similar story about uh, the all these girls in a in a very really claustrophobic German uh, boarding school where uh, a number of them fall in love with with the with the um, one of the teachers, and it you know it's 1939 Germany and that goes you know very far. It's quite radical how it and. It, some people claim that it was upon seeing that movie in 1939 that she decided that she had a, a similar story to tell and wrote uh, and wrote this novel. The other interesting thing, uh, and I want to thank Maria again for referring me back to the biography of the woman on the actual historical woman on, on whom Madame Mademoiselle Jolie is, Jolie is based, which is Marie Sylvestre, and I was reading up on her. Uh, Ajiman, by the way, I, I, I think this, I, I, I could do without this preface introduction by André Ajiman, but um, he gets it wrong when he says that Dorothy went to school with Eleanor, Eleanor Roosevelt. It's actually when the Marie Suvesse broke up with her um, partner, longtime lesbian partner and founder of the, of the school in Fontainebleau in, in France, she started a new school in London, not in Canada as takes place in the novel. And there she had Eleanor Roosevelt as a, uh, as a student. And uh, it's clear that Eleanor Roosevelt fell in love with um, Marie Souvestre in a, almost a, the same way as Olivia does with Mademoiselle Julie because th there was a great deal of correspondence up until the very end, long after um, Marie died, Eleanor Roosevelt would carry these letters with her wherever we went, like sacred relics. Uh, and there was some real powerful um, connection there that was, it could well have been, you know, a consummated relationship. Maybe not, we don't, I don't, I haven't, didn't have enough time to research it's not all that important, but it, it does show that um, this no little hundred page novel or novella really opens up a bunch of questions also uh, that are directly related to our, uh, you know, one of our first women, famous first women. So I, there are some questions here that take that are uh, two questions. Uh, one is anonymous, but it's related to the second one. Sorry to drop this all down to a lower plane, but who killed Kara? Kara. And Hilton Obenzinger is also a uh, regular attendee. He says, thanks for the terrific insights. What do you think of the final part of the novel? It seems to become very dark, almost a murder mystery. How does this relate to the love education aspect? Um, So it, I think it's true that there was an intrigue at the end about what on earth happened there with Mademoiselle Cara. And this is, I'm gonna go back to something Maria said, or maybe ask Maria yourself to um, think in terms of the way the difference between the protagonist and the novelist, clearly, the, the novelist does such a good job of remaining within the hori perceptive horizon and limited understanding of everything that's going on around her, of her protagonist, and therefore uh, that she doesn't tr try to probe the depths of this dark, this dark um, event, which is, there's a lot of suggestion that it might have been a homicide, no? Do you think- That's my that understanding. Is that your understanding? Yeah. Um, well, I'm always tempted by the literary, I think more than the, 
the pseudo biographical or auto fictional context, but my my reading of the um, I, I have it in my notes as like um, here we're slipping into tragedy. Um, that there's a there's obviously a um, as someone put in the questions a, a downgrade here, kind of like a, a shifting of gears, and and we're verging on an opening. We're, we're really crashing open the walls of the school. We we destroy the the rhythm. We destroy the schedules. We destroy we destroy the class meetings. We destroy everything when. Um, when these relationships cease being kind of tensions and and scandals and little um, goings on between and behind closed doors, and they start to become actual action, we get uh, clearly either a, a fatal error or a homicide. And and I'm not going to come down on either of those because it's not concluded in the work. But the thing that um, that makes this entire scenario, in my opinion, very literary, very um, elegant uh, by the author is that in the very beginning of her introduction, she refers to the writing of this work as a refuge, as kind of taking and snuggling oneself into an armchair on a difficult winter. And one of the most moving, viscerally moving passages of, of this ending section of the work is when Julie pulls Olivia up where she's freezing on the floor after keeping vigil of Julie's vigil and warms her up again and brings her back into, uh, she gives her a hot drink and she rubs her feet and she rubs her hands and she covers her in shawls. And we have uh, we have Olivia falling asleep like that, warmed up again and awaking to pretty much the end of the book. Um, and, and I think that there's, uh, there's something to be said about the parallel in that experience, which is the beginning of the end, that real comforting contact with this woman and the experience of writing the novel. Uh, of going back and actually reliving um, the protagonist's experiences and getting them down for once 30 years later or 50 years later, really. Um, but I wouldn't be able to answer, you know, who killed Kara because uh, we're not, even though it's hinted at and we can, we can guess, we can decide for ourselves, it's not, uh, it's not concluded. Toby, do you have any, did you, did the ending intrigue you? Uh, the, did you, were you asking yourself, was it actually the student who uh, miscalculated the dose or was, you know, she's just written her will, it's all going to Frau Reisner, mm -hmm. and what do you think? I, I have to agree with Maria that, uh, I mean, I puzzled over the evidence that's given, such as it is, and, uh, and it doesn't allow us to reach it. A, a, a conclusion, but what we do see is the various uh, possibilities, the, the play of motives that could have led any one of those people, including Cara herself, to have administered the, the fatal dose. But all the, well, there were two doses in here then, but then, you know, the, there were five and then there were, it, it really is impossible to reduce it to a, 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 you know, a clear answer. And I obviously was not meant to be able to be reduced in that. Yeah. I, I, found, I found it suspicious. I found it suspicious that the police were not able to come to a conclusion, but they, they seem very unsatisfied with the hypothesis that this was an accident of, uh, of dosage on the part of a student. Uh, that to me kind of led me to suspect the darker, darkest of motives, which is that she was bumped off by Frau Reisner. Mm -hmm. But the other, the last part of, um, the last part of, Hinton's question there is about what it has to do with uh, the love and education theme. And I think the relationship between Julie and Cara was really, I mean, it's clearly a love relationship, lesbian relationship, long-term partnership, but it was also a partnership of teachers and mistress, headmistresses founding a school. And their vocation as teachers was very much part of the problem here because of the jealousies or the sense that Kara had that Julie was um, kind of stealing students away or, or was more popular 
than she was and that had the best students, you know, rallying behind her and not Julie and not her, that this sort of um, terrible uh, conflictual tension that is introduced by this excessively promiscuous boundary crossing on the part of both teachers, actually, you know? uh, Julie being more seductive, Caja being more charm offensive uh, strategy, but um, it, they hold to their pedagogical vocation. And they felt that, uh, I, I think Cara felt that her, her, that vocation was what was being uh, somehow uh, profaned by the ongoings uh, in, uh, in the dormitory. You know? I think it's an interesting moment when Olivia is visiting uh, Kata and um, Julie treats her as if she has a mind, treats Olivia as if she has uh, a mind. And Kata, it is, you don't like me, do you? It, it, it there's, there's, you, you see something very different there in the two of them. Uh, she needs her charm to work. She needs to, to uh, uh, you know, to seduce, but in a very different way than, from what we see Julie doing. Right. So we have a question here from An Andrea White. While male homosexuality, Dorothy's own brother included, Dorothy's brother being Lytton, Strachey, famous uh, Bloomsbury, right? While male homosexuality was present in the life and literature of the day, was lesbianism as written about and accepted in avant-garde circles like Bloomsbury? And I, you know, I think yeah. I'd say the answer is yes. What do you say, Maria? Um, I would just point to Orlando yeah. um, by Virginia Woolf, which is usually the, the major reference there um, to, in order to say yes. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and to Virginia Woolf's reference to uh, obviously a contended theoret theoretical point of view, but the androgyny of the, of the writer, um, the ability to occupy the mind of um, uh, kind of slippage in, in gender in order to get into uh, the, the various characters that they want to, to explore and to present. Right. And of course, the novel is dedicated to the memory of Virginia Woolf, no? Correct. Well, it's a VW, but we can only assume. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so often Dorothy Strachey is associated with the Bloomsbury group, but she was, this novel is in no way uh, modernist in its style. I don't, would you agree? It's, it's, a, it's not experimental, it's more just a straightforward, rather um, naive, it almost has this faux naive narrative. It's straightforward and it's, uh, a little girlish in, in, a, in a very effective way, you know? Um, and I would have mentioned Colette Terry, since you asked, who not only did all the Claudine novels, but wrote the screenplay to, for the film version of Olivia with Edgewood, Ferrier, lesbian screen star of classic French cinema. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, you know, I have not seen the movie and I don't know what, um, whether Dorothy Strachey had any, what connection she might've had with Colette. But of course, if we were doing this in a class and, you know, obviously in a class of this, uh, about this kind of literature and genre, it would definitely be, extremely germane. Uh, Clay Bullwinkle, a good friend of uh, Another Look, is asking, would you agree that Julie falls into the category of predator because of her failure to establish sufficient distance with those susceptible over whom they have power? Don't teachers, managers, coaches, religious leaders, family members, etc., have the obligation of keeping distance, the encroachment of which violates their mission? You know, in the United States of America, the answer is definitely yes. There are, you know, boundaries that are taken to be almost sacrosanct that um, 
are supposed to be keeping a distance between teachers, managers, coaches, and, and so forth. But I think that I gather that the three of us do agree that what makes the novel interesting as a novel is that these boundaries become uh, not only ambiguous, but, they, but they, they're, they're crossed without knowing how, how much they're being crossed and how much they're being respected. Julie, uh, she goes into the room at night. She sometimes will allow her hand to be held and to be kissed. And, and you know, it can go very far in terms of physical affection. Does it ever cross that line into actual, into uh, uh, that, that we would consider uh, statutory? I don't think so. At least the author hasn't given us any indication that there was uh, that that line was being crossed. So um, she. It's one thing that um, maybe I'll just add there that makes the relationship itself almost literary in a sense because the what actually happens between Olivia and Julie, if the the exact same actions and encounters and contact points had been recounted with a seriously different set of um, it, uh, emotional attractions and erotic impulses on the part of Olivia, if the same story had been told by someone who was not attracted to Julie, there would be nothing in those, uh, in those interactions that would have gone outside the norm of a women's school in the 1880s in Paris. And going into a 16-year-old um, student's room in the evening to check on her after having had a cold. And, and so what's so interesting about the, the relationship is precisely the, the decision that the author makes to explicitly state the subtext and say, this was not, um, this was not strictly uh, uh, a, a teacher being affectionate. I was in this, I was emotionally very involved in this and the erotic charge that was present there had everything to do with my year of, of awakening. And it comes to through an experience of literature. Uh, she talks of uh, uh, Olivia uh, speaks of how uh, her reading of uh, Shakespeare and Racine awakens in her uh, uh, that she recognizes herself in those verses and that they help define her. And when Julie is reading, as she says, there becomes a, you know, the distance collapses between the reader and the person who's, who, who is being read to and who is finding herself in the things that are being read, uh, a recognition of herself and an enlargement of her sense of life. And, she, and to actually quote a line from her here, to sit at, uh, at her hand, at Julie's hand, right hand, was an education in itself. Uh, so, you know, as you suggested really at the beginning of our conversation, Robert, there is a kind of uh, uh, impossible intermingling of love and awakening, uh, yeah. intellectual, spiritual awakening in, in, in this relationship. Exactly, and what you say about listening and reading, it, it's, it's a very intimate, uh, it's a very intimate sort of um, penetration, if you want, of the mind. I'm gonna read from page 19. I think this is what you ha had in mind, Toby. What a strange relationship exists between the reader and his listener. What an extraordinary breaking down of barriers. Yeah. The listener is suddenly given the freedom of a city at whose gates he would never have dreamt of knocking. He may enter forbidden precincts. He may communicate at the most sacred altars with a soul he has never dared, never will dare approach. Watch without fear or shame a spirit that has dropped its arms, its veils, its prudences, its reserves. This is, this is very sexual language of, of entering and of undressing and unveiling and of, of standing naked in, the, in, in one's soul. He who is not beloved may gaze and hearken and learn at last what nothing else will ever reveal to him and what he longs to know even at the cost of life itself, how the beloved face is moved by passion, how scorn sits upon those features and anger and love, 
uh, how the beloved's voice softens and trembles into tenderness or breaks into the anguish of jealousy and grief. Oh, but it is too soon to say all this. All these are reflections of a later uh, date. What a beautiful passage that is. It's just beautiful. So Toby, you having written this boy's life, which is, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's completely different kind of uh, narrative, but it's it, a very completely different kind of world. Do you, uh, do you find that, that there's, uh, that uh, it had a special resonance, this story for you, just because of your own, uh, the kind of labor that you put it into and the kind of inspiration that, that led you to write this boy's life? Um, did you see any correlation at all uh, of an awakening? Not so much with this boy's life, but with a novel uh, that I later wrote called Old School, which is set in a in old a, school, yes, in yes. a boarding school. Yeah, uh, the the uh, the jealousy over the affections that I mean, living together is different from when you go home at the end of the day from a school. And things just build up and, uh, and become uh, things that might seem trivial uh, if you can go home at night and be with other friends and have a meal with your family, that sort of thing. Things that might seem trivial in that context become enormously important in this, in this hothouse of a, of a boarding school and where you cannot escape. And, and things build on themselves; they aren't released. And uh, so, yes, I—I I mean, I—I—I, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I am drawn to to this sort of closed world in literature. And the school is uh, is the most closed of worlds, really, in that way. Uh, and especially since people are being formed. That's the, it, this is not a group of people uh, who have already become who they are. These are people who are becoming who they're going to be, and all these things are consequential for them. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I really, really uh, 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 was just drawn in and, and fascinated and, uh, by this novel, and it felt so true to me as it went. Maria, do you want to? Do you want to take a stab at another question? The difficult ones, I'm going to always pass them on to you. What does <laughs> Miss Julie mean when she says late in the book, I have always, quote, I have always been victorious. I wonder now whether defeat wouldn't have been better for us all as well as sweeter. Tough one, huh? That's a great one. Oh, yeah. Um... That's that's a passage I think myself I had in my notes. What what is defeat? Um, and, and I love the fact that in Olivia's quoting of Julie saying this to her, there is the implication that what for Julie is a defeat for Olivia is not going to be considered a defeat. Um, and so already I have the sense that in their own lifetimes there will be a different interpretation of um, of what morality. Uh, determines is correct about uh, homosexual relationships between women. I'm wondering, you know, and, and it's an open question um, about what that means for Julie's relationship, the character Julie's relationship with the other headmistress, um, Kara, if there's this understanding, um, it's, it's the same dynamic in the children's hour, the play that I cited before, that there is a clear um, attraction that goes beyond friendship between the two women, but it's never acted upon uh, in, in the sexual and physical realm. Whether that's the case for uh, Julie and Kara is not, um, it's not decided within the scope of the novel. I think in within the scope of the biography of the woman upon whom Julie is based, there's a bit more consensus that she was in uh, loving long time, long term uh, relationship, uh, cohabitational relationship with her co headmistress, um, and then continued in a new in another relationship with the Italian um, instructor in the in the new school in London. Um, but I would hesitate to import uh, the 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 details of those relationships onto this character who seems to be speaking as a kind of mouthpiece for 
uh, the struggle, the real struggle of, of living a life that you yourself think uh, has something wrong or, or wayward about it and, and, and considering it part of your responsibility to be upright against the allure of those attractions. But I do like the fact that Olivia as a listener here is, is giving us a, uh, a bit of a roundabout access to this, uh, to this recitation on the part of Julie. And, um, and I don't think it's going to apply for her personally. She does not feel the same way that Julie does about, um, she, you know, she says herself, I am no saint. And, and she's saying it so openly at such a young age that I believe she's already kind of taken the pedestal out from under the saints. Yeah. We have Peter Stansky. Peter, how important is the sexual in the relationship between teacher and student? And of course, in the present world, this is a very loaded question. And I think Peter also in the chat, I'm seeing that he, he asked about the connection to Gide. So this, uh, you know, it's, it's very difficult for uh, certainly me because I'm in between Maria as a graduate student and Toby as a retired teacher. It's it difficult to, to make any pronouncements on this issue of how important is the sexual between teacher and student. And I wish. This, what's that? I'm joking. Yeah, I, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think in, to stick with the novel, what uh, I think in this novel, I think the sexual has to be um, called affection and not sexuality. I think that what Olivia, her bliss, as Dante says, that he saw the, 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 all, the, all the ranges of possible bliss when Beatrice greeted him. He didn't want anything more from Beatrice in that greeting because that greeting in Italian, salute, also is, it means a greeting, it also means salvation. So that was, uh, that's all he, and when she denied it, then he fell into this uh, terrible funk. What Olivia wants from Julie is these uh, reassurances of affection that she in, indeed is loved and that she ho holds a place in Julie's heart. And um, uh, she, she asked for that and, and, um, and that's, the ultimate, it's the same way you would, you know, ask for, um, for, well, from Socrates, that Socrates would generously give his own blessings to his students. And that blessing means a lot more, I think, in the psychology of our protagonist than any kind of sexual awakening and a new experience, you know. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I think affection takes the place of, of sex in this, in this particular dynamic. That's my view. Maybe it's a minority view. I think Olivia is of the same opinion. In the end, she writes this novel out of adoration for the education that she was um, you know, initiated into by Julie. But the character, the protagonist, at the end of the narrative thrust, hates Julie. She can't stand her because that's the erotics speaking and she's been shunted, you know, she's been, she's been cast aside, but she gets over that lower impulse and she rises to a higher literary, and this is a very outdated kind of uh, dichotomy of, of possible um, opinions of what is superior, uh, you know, the sexual or the intellectual, but in, in terms of what the protagonist chooses, she overcomes that lower impulse that's dragging her into uh, emotional turmoil and she's able to reap the benefits of uh, the relationship that she developed with Julie on the, on the long term. Yeah. I think so, that applies today as well. What's that? I think that would apply today as well. You know, that you, you can never cleanse the human experience or, or it would be a shame to try to, but yeah. you can also recognize that, you know, within the more confused emotional encounters with each other, there are also avenues towards uh, enlightenment and, and long-term self-improvement. Right. Well, here I'm going to take, read another follow-up question by Peter Sansky because it's in, it's interesting, and I have it. I have my own answer to it, which is: to what degree is this a Bloomsbury novel? Uh, a topic 
dear to Peter Sansky's heart, the Bloomsbury School. After all, it is dedicated to the memory of Virginia Woolf. Shouldn't she be a part of your conversation, namely Virginia Woolf? Um, I, I suppose Virginia Woolf should be a part of the conversation. Again, as I said earlier, not because there was any sort of um, uh, direct literary affinity in the, in the narrative styles and strategies. I think that I'm so grateful that Dorothy Strachey did not try to go Virginia Woolf mm. and write in that, you know, in that kind of mode because it just wouldn't have worked for a story of this sort. But, uh, you know, we're, we're studying, we're reading Virginia Woolf in our philosophical reading group. And what I would maybe invoke here is Virginia Woolf's um, made a distinction in, her, uh, I think it's sketches of the past that she said, most of our lives are spent in what she calls non-being. And there are these exceptional moments which of being. So these moments of being are, you know, for the most part, we do things by habit. We do things that are uh, remaining within the realm of the familiar and the routine, and it, and it can all be, um, it can all be very pleasant and, and even amount to happiness. But there are these moments of being which are exceptional in life where, where all of a sudden there's an awakening. There is an, a complete opening or disclosure of the, uh, the horizon of perception and uh, the world becomes strange and there's parts of the self that are um, uh, put into relief that you never suspected of being there. And she, Virginia Woolf is very eloquent when she describes these moments of being. And I would say if there is a Wolfian uh, aspect to Olivia, it's that this is a moment of being in an extended prolonged sense in, the, in, in exactly the way that Virginia Woolf understood it. Where, and, and this might go back to what you were saying earlier, Maria, which is how can uh, Dorothy Strachey, she was my age when she wrote this book, and she's so much in the mindset of the 16 year old because those moments of being, as you said, they are imprinted indelibly in that very intimate place of the soul. Uh, and therefore they don't, um, you know, they, they don't just deliquesce the way what Virginia Woolf calls moments of non-being deliquesce. Hmm. Hmm. That's great. Yeah. So let's see, it's, uh, I'm trying to, yes. I, thank you to Terry Castle again for pointing out that Strachey was also Suvestko's deputy teacher later after the Olivia period, which is true because uh, Dorothy uh, went and taught in the school that Suvest opened in London. And she became, I think she was teaching Shakespeare so there you go. I, I love what Maria said, that this is not a novel where you, it's either marriage or death. There are alternatives here. And, you know, this love of literature that was a, really the true gift to her uh, was, was, became a vocation. And, and she went on to teach Shakespeare. She went on to translate André Gide. There's another question about the role of André Gide in, in this whole thing, because she was, I don't, I, I think she, she rather overestimated you know, for me, there's a kind of over overestimation of André Gide's literary standing and from my point of view, but she was extremely devoted to him and translated all of his works into English. And, and that was also part of the legacy of this awakening that took place in her adolescence, which was, a, it was a, it's a sexual awakening at the same time as a literary awakening. There's no doubt about that. And uh, yeah. Any last comments, Maria? I'll ask you first. No, that sounds great to me. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed some of these, some of these points and some of the questions. You know. Good. And uh, Toby, you have uh, any words of wisdom to leave us with? We... Just, just you know, uh, to uh, 
to glance off your last comment, I think that it's not a coincidence that uh, at least for some of us, sexual awakening happens with literary awakening. Um, yeah. Yes, and that is no mean lesson to take away from the book. No? So I'd like to thank all of you in the audience out there. And, you know, unfortunately we, uh, we don't see you all and we don't um, have your names, except if you enter the chat or the, uh, the Q and A, but we appreciate your tuning in and we um, are going to do our best to select a novel that's equally, if not even more engaging next time we meet here on another look. So you all take care. Thank you to Tope. Toby Wolf, thank you to Maria Masuko, and I'm Robert Harrison for another look. Bye bye. Good night, everybody. Mm -hmm.